At the beginning of Lent, we talk about sin and temptation. Jesus dealt with his demons. We all have to deal with our demons, amen? I asked Leslie Bauer, our secretary, to spell it with a small d in the bulletin. So you'd know, I mean the word metaphorically. As our mission statement goes, we are a congregation of faith and doubt. And I doubt there are such things as demons, literally. But Jesus was tested in the wilderness and passed the test. You might call it spiritual training. After being baptized in the river Jordan, Luke says the spirit of God led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Well, he's in the desert. It was the absolute margin of the world. He's completely alone with himself, wrestling with his psyche. What should I do with my life? What is my calling? Whenever we struggle with issues, there are powers and forces that tempt us, powers and forces from the economy, the world of fashion, the world of peer relationships, family relationships. They have the ability to overpower us. They can hold us hostage if we let them. They keep us from maturing for fully, from living out our God-given potential. We've been given so much intelligence, freedom to act on our choices, the ability to communicate and collaborate, cooperate with each other, the ability to manage, the ability to dream for the future. Jesus was in a similar situation. His whole life was ahead of him. But then these forces embodied in the devil for the purposes of this story begin to speak to him. Temptations are often shortcuts, quick fixes, you know. Are you hungry? Why don't you use your power to turn these stones into bread? But Jesus speaks. It is written, people won't live only by bread. Jesus must have been feel feeling quite physically weak after all that time with nothing to eat. So he's tempted to put his own needs first, but he's able to resist. He passes the test. Next, the embodiment of evil tries to tempt Jesus to become famous and powerful. He led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. To you, I will give their glory and all their authority. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, it is written, you will worship only the Lord your God and serve only God. Finally comes the suggestion, why don't you just throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple? God won't let you be hurt. You can't fail because God is on your side. And Jesus replies, it has been said, don't test the Lord your God. Jesus was being uh, offered a bunch of quick fixes, a bunch of shortcuts. But there really are no shortcuts, you know. Even when you are alone with yourself, you're never alone. There are these powers, these great resistant forces speaking to you from your phone, from your mother's voice in your head or your dad's or your great aunt's or your teacher's or some peer relationship. They can hold us captive if we let them. If we do, it may keep us from maturing fully, from living out our God-given potential. It's very hard to ignore them so that we can face the questions we need to ask. What should I be doing with my life? What is my calling? What do I owe other people? What do I owe myself? It's training, really. It's all about training, not for perfection, but to make progress. You know what training involves, the wrestler, the musician, the dramatist, the long distance runner, the swimmer, the basketball player, submitting to the rigors of practice, submitting to a discipline. It's about making the right moves, doing the right thing over and over in order to overcome the obstacles that hold us back from living out our God-given potential. The season of Lent is about spiritual fitness, not about perfection or perfectionism, but about 
training to be what God wants us to be. There are no shortcuts. You can't take a pill to adjust your spiritual chemistry. You can't lose 40 pounds of ego fat in 40 minutes a day for 40 days by downloading a video. There are no shortcuts. A martial arts student went to his teacher and said, I am devoted to studying your martial arts system. How long will it take me to master it? The teacher said, 10 years. But I want to master it faster than that. I work very hard. I will practice every day, 10 or more hours a day if I have to. How long will it take then? The teacher paused as if calculating in his head. 20 years then. There are no shortcuts. 40 days and 40 nights is a biblical way of saying a really, really long time. That's why Lent has 40 days and 40 nights. We are getting ready with Jesus for the big stuff ahead. We are in training, not for perfection, but for progress. How do we help our kids with their training? How do we raise ethical kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whoever's in your life, kids who will tell right from wrong? How do we ourselves learn to be ethical? I heard a radio news program raising ethical children. They talked to a man who runs an organization that trains parents and people to think ethically. His name is Rush Kidder. He does training for corporations, schools, and groups of parents. The first step is easy, he says, telling right from wrong. You ask, is this illegal? Is it against the rules? If not, there's another question. We just call it the stench test. Does the thing just plain stink? At some gut level, in some instinctive way, is it just wrong? Suppose it passes that one, then we go on to what's called the front page test. How are you going to feel if everything you did shows up on the front page of tomorrow morning's paper or on YouTube or on Facebook? And finally, the one I love to get to is what we call the mom test. The mom test is what would my mom do in this situation? He says the most important thing that parents can do for their kids is to set a good example. They can also help their kids to think about ethical choices. A mother told him, my three-year-old still tells the truth. The nine-year-old, mm, not so much. I'd say a lie daily to weekly, it's been an issue. Kidder tells her that younger children lie, but they don't cover it up. Older kids do both. But kids can learn to do right. They can learn to act with what he calls moral courage. We've seen some of that this week, haven't we, on the news, down in the subway stations that they're using for bomb shelters in Ukraine. Here's an example one parent gave. Her daughter saw some children picking on another child on the school bus. Mother said, so she's a very quiet girl, but she actually kind of stood up and said, hey, stop doing that. That's bullying. And I said to her, what happened next? And the little girl said, well, they didn't hear me, so I had to say it again. The mother said, it made me very proud of her. It was something that hopefully was based on her values that she has ingrained in her. Sometimes we need courage, don't we, to act. It helps to have some training. We face many challenges. There are powers and forces that tempt us. Sometimes we let them get the best of us. We do the wrong thing. Then we say, what was I thinking? But it doesn't have to be that way. We were created in the image of God, every single one of us. We can be mature. We can forgive ourselves. We can forgive each other. We can fully accept God's grace and understand that after all, we are good enough. Not perfect, but good enough. We can live out our full God-given potential. Jesus shows us the way. When confronted with temptation, Jesus resisted strenuously I doubt that Jesus was so physically strong, but he showed the strength of a superior rabbinic training. 
Remember, this is the only gospel, the gospel of Luke, where we meet him as a middle school age kid. And where is he? He's disputing and teaching and learning with the rabbis in the temple. So when he was confronted with these forces that were so threatening and out there in the desert, he quoted the scriptures. I will rely only on the word of God. Jesus shows us the way. And God will raise us up on eagle's wings. Bear us with the breath of dawn. Make us to shine like the sun and hold us in the palm of God's hand. Amen.